In this video, I wanted to talk through some of my standard advice that I give when students come to my class and they're asking how can they do better in my flipped classrooms. And I think I want to begin with what to do before class. Now, as you know, we make this big video series, and the big video series is sort of the anchor point, the foundation for everything that we do in the flipped classrooms. And as you know, you should be watching the videos. But what I want to talk a little bit is about how to watch those videos. And I've made actually a whole video before on making, on watching videos in these flipped classrooms, but the, the, the couple details I really wanted to emphasize was, number one, I think you should be making really good quality notes. Now by that, I don't just mean transcribing whatever I put on the screen. I, what I want you to do is really thinking and articulating in your mind what the key ideas are and then taking notes on those ideas. It can be done either pausing in the middle of the video or at the end of the video. So that's the first thing, take really wonderful quality notes. Second point before class, what I like to do is something called a blind summary. There's a big difference between you listening to me or one of our other instructors and you verifying that what we say makes sense to you. That's one thing, and it's a good thing and an important thing, but it's a different thing from you being able to turn around, for instance, and teach the same content to somebody else. So what a blind summary does is this. You don't look at the video. You don't look at the wonderful notes that you wrote out. You sit back and you try to think, what is the big point of this video? What math problem were we trying to solve? What was the major definition or concept? And if there was an example, what was the major process of going through it? Can you do a summary like this after you've watched a five or 10 minute video? You might find that you are or are not, and if you're not, that's wonderful. You get to go back and look at your notes and try to figure it out. You can also do these blind summaries like 12 hours later, for example, right before the class starts. And this will say, do you recollect from the video enough that you're prepared and able to go to class? So I really like taking the notes. I like doing the blind summaries. The third thing I like to do before class is we want to make sure that when you come to class, you are fired up and ready to go and to engage in the problems. So what you can do is you can do one or two problems before class. Now I'm going to start actually putting some suggested problems into the Blackboard descriptions where you can go to the textbook and you can read some of the fully worked out examples they have in the textbook. And you can try it yourself first and if it doesn't go very well then you can read the textbook solution. But the point is to help that transition from before class to during class so that you're really able to be engaged and making a productive use of your time in class tackling the problems. So that's before class. Now what are we going to do in class? Well, in class, as you know, we're going to be trying all of these different problems. We're going to be trying to be engaged. We're going to be working well. We're going to be collaborating. We're going to be asking questions. We're going to be answering questions. But there's one other little detail that I want to add, which is if you go and you find some problem and you are not 100% confident with it, maybe I put it on the screen, you write it down, but you're only 70%. I want you to circle that problem. And then after class, once a week, I want you to go down, or more than once a week, I want you to go and look through your worksheets from the prior week. The solutions will be posted online, but if you don't want to, it's better actually even to try those problems again. And if you don't get them, then you can get help from me, from the office hours, you can go to the math center, many different ways that you can get supports for trying to do this sort of post-class review. So that's the third point. Do these wonderful post-class reviews. Give yourself another kick at the can. Make sure that your ship of calculus knowledge doesn't have any holes in it. Final point is the web assignment. Now, web assign, a lot of students do it as this sort of extra practice, this thing they have to do to get the sort of 5% in their course, but I want you to treat it as an assessment. What I really want you to do is to, to think, have you mastered this content? Are you ready for the test? Or do you need to do more work? So I would put most of your effort into reviewing the packages, to trying the practice web assign. And when it comes time for the actual web assign, I want you to genuinely and honestly do them yourself and see whether you can do it or whether you still need to do practice. What a lot of students do, and it's a reasonable strategy, is they find similar problems to the web assign problems and then they sort of clone them over. And that's a reasonable strategy, but it's a different strategy from saying that you've mastered the content and you're able to do it on the test. So I really want you to try without resources, try those web assigned problems first as an assessment of your knowledge and as a practice of what you know before you necessarily jump in and try to find resources so that you can shoot for that say 100% of the web assign. Now I'm doing this in my in my second bedroom here, but uh, we, we've got something of a, oh, here he comes. Oh. 
something of a whiny baby and he's up causing some problems right now. So, oh yeah, that's all, that's okay. Yeah, that's all right, baby James. Anyways, we're worried. Now, many of these different strategies that I've talked about, doing the pre-class work, doing the post-class review, doing the web assign... <laughs> oh, he's just too cute. He's just too cute. A lot of these strategies are based on a couple different things from the literature on how students learn effectively. So I want to say just a quick thing about that so you can sort of conceive of why I'm telling you these strategies. The, the first is something that we know very well from literature. It's the difference between spaced learning and mass learning. Now, mass learning is what you're probably doing a lot of when you're studying for a test. You've got like eight hours, you're going to cram it all in in like one day before the test. And that mass practice, we know, is relatively ineffective for long-term retention of knowledge, sort of a negative exponential decay in terms of how well you retain it. But if you take the same amount of time and you space it out, 20 minutes here, half an hour there, 10 minutes there, you're going to have a much more effective long-term recollection of your content. Now, the ironic part is that it actually feels a little bit worse when you do this spaced retrieval because Every time you start it again, you're, you, you're sort of lost the familiarity and you have to spend a few minutes even remembering what the topic is about and remembering the definitions and it kind of feels bad when you do mass practice. It's got this great illusion of mastery because everything's familiar. You've just been studying it for a whole bunch. You don't have to test whether you pull it out of your long-term memory. You can sort of pull it out of your short-term and medium-term memory. So the mass practice feels good, but it's worse, and the space practice feels worse, but it's better for your learning. So that's why I, I try to space it out a little before class, you're doing stuff in class, you're reviewing your worksheets after class, and then you're going on to the website. Space it out like this. The second thing is, we really want students to be doing what I like to call active sense making. That is, passive learning is when you watch a video, when you read my solutions, when you read the textbook, anything where an expert's telling you the answer, and what you're doing is you're affirming you're understanding the reasonableness of what this expert has told you. But that's very different from constructing new knowledge yourself in your own mind out of your prior knowledge. So the whole design of a flip class is to get you working on problem after problem after problem. And even when the problems are hard and you don't get anywhere, you're still constructing that mental schema so that when you have answers, you can sort of slot them in into appropriate places. So what my suggestion for you is to be as active in your learning as possible. When I suggest something like summarizing in a blind summary or suggesting something like trying to make high quality notes where you're not transcribing, where you're trying to construct your own understanding of the key points, the whole idea here is so that you're trying to construct your own conceptualization of the content and that you're working on the content yourself and building your understanding as well. And this is a fabulous learning strategy. So many of the different things that I try to suggest are going to be based on these two different principles. So I hope this video was useful for you. I hope that things are going well in the course and that if not, that you can take some of these ideas and help make your studying and your practice not a whole bunch more hours, but a lot more effective when you're doing it.